Actually, well, it's not GTA, but Watch Dogs. I just learned, like, you can, you can, like, run over as many pedestrians as you want, but if you stop, like, one person from committing a crime, then, like, you're golden. Which is, I don't know, just, there's, open world games are really tough to, to, to maintain. I think the Spider-Man 2 game, back when it came out, the GameCube. Oh, yeah. yeah that one, that was, like, the one open-world game where, like, you just go around doing random act, like, good deeds. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Infamous is really cool about that. Which one? Infamous. Infamous, okay. Have you ever played it? No, I haven't. Um, I don't have certain acts and it makes you good or evil mm -hmm. and you move through a scale going yeah. one way or the other. Oh yeah, those, those scales are kind of problematic. Yeah. It's a bit too bad. So, I, the Total War games, but um, something that I've continuously found to be lacking on those is, um, I mean, obviously, a series named Total War is going to focus on that, but in terms of you're managing an entire system, the focus it directs towards warfare is um, in even a game like it is kind of disproportionate um, and is seen as like a victory mechanic or a challenge um, and I've kind of been disappointed in the ways in which um, I would love to see games which take really Diplomacy uh, towards avoiding war, yeah. uh, as because it, it's the harder way, mm -hmm. um, and to see a game that did that, I would, I would absolutely adore. Has anybody played that game, Democracy Three? Is that I've heard of it? Does that like deal with that at all? Yeah, they like, kept like the, the war games and the uh, civilization building games sort of. Yeah, I don't know. There's not like a. Uh, there's not like a Sim City where you can go to war with somebody else, or like you have to prevent war from happening. Yeah. Or something, so. <laughs> be interesting. You built this industrial metropolis, and now would be interesting. I've, I've seen ones that are. There was a game like I think Pharaohs, like a good 15 years back, that involved building an Egyptian city, and every so often you'd get invading forces, but um, the primary goal was just still building the city. Um, but still, it wasn't the kind of whole civilization or the nation running. Um, 
focus. But I think it would be really because the and that one had no diplomacy. It's about discrimination and hatred and discourse, no one's really fighting for the women of color. There aren't really that many representations in the uh, media and industry, and um, white women are becoming the forefronters of the fight, but the question remains where are these women of color? And my theory is the computer is over here. <laughs> say that they are um, some like a, um, like a different race other than white. And the problem with that is, is that we're not seeing any diversity among the women um, within our community. Um, so some things that we've, that, um, in my research that I found, this all comes from the IGN, or not IGN, um, GDA, which is the International Game, Game Developers Association, it shows how um, they're like in the industry, sorry, how much um, people are like the diversity within the community. Um, among ethnicity, 79% of them are white, 8.2% um, are Latino and Hispanic, 7.5% are East Asian and South. 2.5 are African or African American. Among gender lines, 76% um, uh, are male, 22% are female, 0.5% um, identify as trans man, um, and 0.2% identify as trans woman, and then identifies as other, as they say it in their survey. And I think the attitude towards these, um, the, this diversity shows that to a lot of people, the issue of diversity in the workspace doesn't apply to them because when it comes down to it, the inclusiveness that they're looking for is what suits them because when it comes what a white male, for example, thinks of it, like inclusion, they're getting all that they need. They're, um, a lot of the industry and the community is predominantly white males, so the issue doesn't really matter to them. But when it comes to other um, identities, such as transgender, female, and other, um, and especially different minorities in that, um, in that uh, statistic, 
there are a lot of different issues they're not seeing themselves in the industry in the community. Um, so what does that do? Um, what that does is we get 85% of game characters being white, 9.7% um, being black, 3.7 being bi or multi um, racial, um, 1.75 being Asian, um, and then a part of that, 89.5 um, are male, and then 10.5 are female. And the question is, what does um, the, this do to the women in the minority? And what this creates are um, identities that are fueled by stereotypes, um, assumptions, basically what, what represent these women in the minority as already, um, and if we don't, what do we see in the world for the media? And then, um, other than that, we see like colorblind racism, like whitewashing issues of not really representing um, a certain aspect of people, like making them aliens or something like that. Um, so, bear with us. This, or bear with, bear with me. This was a gigantic study that I found very interesting. And um, what this what this person did, um, she basically did a um, experiment on Xbox Live where she played Call of Duty and attempted to join different clans under different account names. So what you see here is that um, in the uh, gamer tag, she obviously put couple different that maybe has some kind of stereotypical um, outlook on like different minorities. I don't know, you could probably make those out as much as you can. Um, she changed her age um, very, like, fluctuated it a little bit. It stayed around the late teens and early 20s. And she changed her race um, just about every time, but stayed in the black, um, African American, and Latino groups, and she did a test in two different clan names, um, the first one being, um, yeah, Conscious Daughters, and then, um, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, I can't remember that one, it's all crazy letters, but anyway, basically what found out just by, she started with um, observing these different clans and then um, slowly went to talking and playing with these people. But she did find out that both of these clans were predominantly women who played Call of Duty, which is always great to see. And also women in the minority that played Call of Duty. Um, and when she came to talking to different people and started playing with them, um, she found out this orange area, which is um, different sexual orientations that people place on her, which, um, I mean, it fluctuates all over. First, she was called a lesbian, then she was heterosexual, and then bisexual. It, it kind of goes everywhere. And predominantly what she found out is that the username and minority that she put the account under kind of made assume what she was and she also claims that she didn't really change the way she talked to people. She made sure that she wasn't really talking in any weird different way that may have sound, sounded derogatory or racially different. She just tried to be herself and she found that people would um, say like, oh hey, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm gay or anything, but you're really good at this game doesn't make any sense because you're not really physically seeing the person but uh, I don't know how in a video game setting where like you're just talking to someone you could place a sexual orientation on them and then have the audacity to tell them that in their ear. Um, so, anyway. so I think the biggest question here is why? Why, why is it that the of women in the minority aren't being supported 
or aren't um, aren't being allowed to be seen in the, the community and industry. And I think it all comes down to one big word, and it's credibility. Um, credibility meaning that women of color do not have the same rights or privileges as different um, different women in the industry. If you're able to even break into the industry and community, people saying like, oh, I, I've never seen someone like you, or I don't, I don't think that women of color play games. I didn't know that they even had the ability to do that. And um, it's especially hard for women of color going into the industry because trying to get in a company, there's that subtle racism where they are not seen, they're not deemed to be fit because at least a woman, like a white woman, can do a better job than a woman of color. And, you know, it's, it's very subtle, but you see it all the time. And the fact is, is that we just don't see many women of color in the industry. And I think one, one problem with this is just that people are not being, like, even if somebody is, like, publicly, being um, like publicly like saying that they're a gamer and they go to a lot of things and um, people still say that they are a gamer for whatever reason. I think the best example is this, of this is Aisha Tyler. Um, mm -hmm. Incidentally, I have heard my presentation, presentation as Jamin, Jamin Warren did, but um, in that same study of the first Xbox Live thing, um, I so she uh, quoted her from E3 conference, and obviously for people that don't know, um, she's a voice actress on Archer, and she goes to a lot of E3 conferences and stuff just Ubisoft. Um, so I think the best quote is this one. So this was her, um, like what she said to people that don't consider her a gamer. I go to E3 every year because I love video games. Because new line titles still get me hot. Because I still love getting Sage. Love wearing my gamer pride on my sleeve. And people, uh, people ask me what consoles I play. Motherfuck all of them. <laughs> and in the end, is that really? Isn't that all somebody needs? Or is it for women of color? Do they need something different? not be a woman of color. This is, um, I'm curious on this is possibly follow up. Um, since you mentioned, uh, I assume this is primarily focused on American and possibly Canadian development and industry. Because um, the other primary developer, I think, second largest in, uh, game producing industry is Japanese. Um, I suppose the um, gender um, demographics are within the industry side like in Japan. Um, and just comparing that, I think, would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course, the research that I did was very regional to America. But in my research, actually, um, Japan is actually actually becoming China since they lifted their console ban um, ten years sense. ago. They become very, very um, popular and they actually have no one, I think, the number one like gay, general gaming company and they do a lot of other crap. Um, but yeah, 
I just, um, it's probably very different. I would imagine, like, the gender lines are going to be very, yeah. very different. Um, as far as diversity, I can't really speak to that. I don't believe they're in the research, but I would imagine that it might be a little low and void because it's a very, um, it's only kind of been with the culture. But, yeah. yeah. Do you have any thoughts on uh, white? feminist women developers um, and how, whether or not they're doing a good job of, of including people of color in their uh, progressive attitude? Um, well, I think the thing, the thing to think about is that like, when it comes to the feminist movement, um, I mean, I've been in Helen's class all the time and I see you smirking. <laughs> feminist movement and everything is that when it comes to white women trying to fight for their own identities, it doesn't really become an issue where it's trying to be inclusive with all women. Of course, there are women that are trying to fight for more than just themselves and white women everywhere, but at least in the research that I've done and the experience that I've had with the community and industry, it's more, it's become the burden of women of color to defend themselves instead of everyone trying to defend each other. So that's a good answer to that. Thank you, Helen, for your thumbs up. I feel really proud to get a thumbs up. it starts with identifying one's privilege. Like, once you do that, like, you can, like, most people have the issues just like, oh, I don't want to make a game like this because I'm not a person that I, that I identity. But that's also counterproductive because you're not really, if you're, if you're trying to, like, act like you're saving everyone, if you're not identifying your privilege, then you're not going to do a good job because you're going to be like, oh, I'm not going to do this right, so I'm not going to do it but for a lot of people in the gaming industry and community, it just takes that courage and bravery to take on a different community and learn, not from anybody else, but the people within that community to make a good representation of it. Yes, Jack. I mean, this is, this is sort of a big, I mean, just the diversity. There, like, as I showed it in like, the second slide, like, there isn't that much diversity to go around. And even though there are a fair number of people, like, let's say that number, that, like, statistic was 10,000 game developers, and it was that small amount of that minority, that's not to say that they have the tools and abilities to make these good games to get them out. And that's the biggest problem, is that privileged individuals are not, they, they basically do not want, have the courage or bravery to undertake these different issues. And the people that would love to do that don't have the same privileges, like ability to access technology in a way that other people can. So that's 
So that's probably why we're doing it. Like, it's not like you know, nobody's like, oh, I don't want to do it because I don't care. Like, whatever. I don't care about your race at all. It's more that people are, like, they're not in the identity. They don't know how to deal with those different issues of diversity. So they don't approach them. I was just going to add on to that and say that um, because it's the majority white men who are working on games, they don't even think about it. You know, it's not something that they're going to encounter on a daily basis. And they're, it, it, even just if you look in their workplace, you know, something that they go to pretty much every day, they're not going to, you know, come across a lot of women developers. They're not going to come across a lot of people of color. They're definitely not coming across pretty much any women of color. So I mean, if they're if they're not, you know, seeing it, or if they're not, you know, they, they don't know about it, or you know, they don't learn about it, and and know that it's a problem, it's not going to get addressed. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I feel like game, games in this in this sense is a reflection of society. Like this is a problem that we're dealing with everywhere. We just happen to be focusing on. You said, what is it about games? It's I'm not so games, it's just games, yeah. the world.
wildly angry event. It was just like a very, very simmered, like. Yes, everyone was like, I'm not going to. Trying to murder me, that's correct. What? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yes. I knew it. Yes. We turned off the projector and the projector decided that I need to cool down. <laughs> it's going to be another 40 minutes. I really will just do it on here. Can you hook up the computer to the computer? Oh, no, why don't we just use the... Yeah. Uh, I think it's literally corrupt. It's corrupt as well. Do you need to use another? I've got a different flash drive. Can you get a flash drive? Yeah, you can get a flash drive. 
was from a flash drive. Do you want to try a different flash drive? Yeah, absolutely. It's running off of the flash drive, but since it since the file came off of the flash drive, it will still be corrupted. I'm just going to present for my thing. That's fine. Yeah, that is totally It's going to be tiny. That's okay. Pass it around. What do you want to not bother with the portal? I don't have things. Slide show. I did. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be able to see it, but. Uh, oh, it's pretty. Setting game setting, which is uh, the game's choice of theme, artwork, uh, and set pieces. It can be interactive or non interactive, depending on the set piece. You know, an interactive set piece is like a non playable character or usable item, whereas a non interactive set piece is like your wall texture. Um, stereotype is a widely held oversimplified image or idea of a specific person or group of persons. Stereotypes are important to talk about because they are formed as a means of simple communication. Uh, they're often used as shorthand uh, to uh, for. They're often used as shorthand to suture a kind of real feeling environment uh, and teach what uh, can be expected and interacted with. So by using stereotypes, you kind of learn as a player earlier before you even play the game. In these, there are several important parts of social construction that go into this, such as stereotype threat, which is essentially the confirmation bias inherent in stereotypes, where if you tell someone that this is how this person acts, and they feel and identify as that kind of stereotype, they will act in that stereotypical way. Um, on top of that, there's also the safe here war hypothesis, which is essentially along the lines that uh, the language and worlds that you interact with uh, shape how you see the world and change how you understand it. Um, another important part of this is cultural appropriation, which is the usage of other cultures, uh, cultural features for your own benefit. Um, borrowing elements of a culture Part of this that plays mainly, plays largely in digital cultures is identity tourism, which is the exploration of other social cultures and uh, identities and expressing yourself as that identity. As a, in a video game, I could play as a woman, although I do not personally identify as a woman, in order to explore that kind of a world. Um, it's really made possible in cyberspace where this is a thing. Another major concept is universal orientalism, which is applying the orientalist thought to uh, the you know, entire world, uh, where any non-central character is distorted to present that dis that difference, uh, putting them in a category known as the other, that which is not the main character, the main person. Um, in uh, this is often used with non-playable characters. It creates a form of cognitive dissonance uh, for negative actions. That's, this allows you to do things such as promote ignorance or violence against these other characters. Another important part of this is similar and dissimilar culture between the developer and the uh, character. An important uh, good version of this would be Papo and Yo, which is developed by Brazilian developer about the uh, about Rio and uh, versus 
dissimilar culture, which uh, has characters like Coltrane from Gears of War's franchise, who is largely viewed as stereotypical and does not fit with the developer's culture, developers being primarily white. Um, game settings are often a stereotype of several different things, including time and temporality, which is the historical or modified historical stereotypes, such as like pirates or steampunk or like medieval times. Um, genre, which uses obviously genre tropes, such as noir, fantasy, or science fiction, and geographic location, such as uh, stereotypical locations abstract or literal, including stereotypes of the culture and features of that location, such as like the quote, quote, Asia, the desert, the city. And that's going to be the one that I'm focusing on in this presentation. There are others beyond these, but these are some of the ones that are most easy to identify. Um, so some examples of, of these geographical locations are fantasy versions of geography, fantasy versions of culture and fantasy versions of both geography and culture. We're going from like a desert kind of a feel to like a city environment which has a very defined culture or to like a quote, you know, fantasy version of Asia which has whatever stereotypes fall there. Um, so I'm going to focus upon the city first as a fantasy version of culture. Uh, which is a representation of a real world and an existent culture with no specific geography. The culture it represents is stereotypical, therefore. Uh, it presents NPCs that ascribe to stereotypical culture, you know, prostitutes, businessmen, thugs, and police. I'm using kind of generalized words here. Um, as well, it presents challenges that ascribe to these stereotypical cultures such as drug dealing, evading police, theft, or violent crime, uh, violent conflict. On the other side of the things, you have just a fantasy version of the geography. Uh, in this kind of a desert zone world, you have NPCs that describe just the geographic location and are not and are seen in stereotypical ways and are allowable because they exist within this geographical location. Uh, you know, cactus creatures, bone creatures, but also like fakirs or like gypsy characters. Um, we also present challenges that ascribe to just the geography, such as sandstorms, water loss, mirages, or just loss of orientation. Challenges that are specific to that geography. Uh, and then there's both geography and culture present in a single uh, setting. The, my version of this is Asia for uh, easy reasons. Um, it represents NPCs that fit into these cultural stereotypes uh, and that fit into these geographical stereotypes. So you have ninjas, you have martial artists, you have pandas, you have samurai. Um, you also have challenges that ascribe to the stereotypes and stories of that geographical and cultural area, such as stealing an ancient, stealing away an ancient evil, fighting your way through a quote dojo, uh, defeating a despotic warlord, or becoming a ninja, working your way towards that warrior. So basically, stereotypes are used as a shorthand for settings, making them easier to digest, easier for the developer and the player. But this enforces tired stereotypes of the people who live within those settings. It encourages shallow understanding of the people involved, and it encourages a stereotypical and harmful thinking. Um, this says about developers that they're not just you know a bunch of racists. Um, they use stereotypes because they're easy to tell stories with. What can they do to be 
be less problematic, they can be aware of what makes these stereotypes problematic and create more original worlds that avoid these stereotypes. It's difficult to do because we how green stereotypes are in our culture and that they are easy to use. Um, they can also attempt to flesh out the world that they have already created, attempting not to other or orient their orient the Um, their NPCs and flesh out their characters. Um, about the players, players are participants and be, by being exposed to these stereotypes. We tend to accept them as part of the world that we interact in. Um, this can be active, where you know, you're killing these other NPCs, or this can be passive, where you're simply existing in the world with However, this will only affect players if we are unaware of it. Um, as players, we should actively recognize these stereotypes and recognize that our world is distinctly different from the world on screen. This creates a cognitive dissonance and allows the player to step out of this fantasy realm. So now, what do you think? And question time. <laughs> There's this thing I have talked to um, my mother extensively about because she's <laughs> the only one who listens to me. Um, <laughs> and trust her because she's also the only one who listens to me. Um, <laughs> assume that you know fans want a more engaging and intellectual world very often I mean the stereotypes go both ways it's easy for the player as well so if you have an environment in which a player is interacting with stereotypical things it, it creates an ease of access and so it would it would take significantly more storytelling to kind of a point, but I think that it, for the uh, creators to strive for that, it does tend to reward them with a fan base that is more devoted to their story than just the game and the experience itself. Because, because part, of, part of it for me is that I, for a very long time, um, enjoyed formulaic television, um, television that predictable life
said about myself because I was like, I know what's going to happen now. I know who the killer is and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, I got bored. And I think that's like, that's just what's inevitable with these kind of tropes. Like, it, they just play themselves out over time. And even people who love repetition, even people who love to have the same thing over and over again, after a while you start to get sick of it, even if it's like not even on a conscious level. So if you're offered or you're like given something that's more diverse, something that's more interesting, something that's more nuanced, more intelligent, maybe you're not going to like, you know, go out and buy it on your own, but if someone shows it to you, you could be like, oh, this is super cool too. And it might branch you out. I didn't like you couldn't see it because it was so small probably but I took a good faith effort to attempt to include a whole bunch of different types of games mm -hmm. that are repeating these stereotypes yeah so there were possible platformer games and other video games you know, Mario does this sometimes <laughs> you get the other kind of uh, you know more in-depth Game uh, Shogun Warlord, which is a full full on war historical game, you know, obviously mm -hmm. has that kind of a, yeah. uh, similarity. But on top of that, there's also this same kind of stereotyping taking place in board games mm -hmm. and in pen and paper RPGs for the worlds that people are allowed to create them, create within. And one of the most important things about pen and paper RPGs is, is that they tend to have a predetermined world that you use as a backboard to draw off of. Um, even some of the most open-ended ones, like Pathfinder, mm -hmm. find themselves repeating these kinds of ethnic and racist stereotypes. Right, and it's, I think it's up to
now ignore the forces of capitalism at work in <laughs> to work with cultures and tell their story. Um, one of the uh, best games that did this, that we actually were attempting to display at the symposium earlier today, but had some technical issues, is this game called Never Alone, yeah. which is a, I forget the name of the Native American, uh, Native Alaskan group, but uh, it works with a group of their storytellers and game developers who come from that culture to develop a game that tells a story and creates a world completely insular. It uses game mechanics and does borrow a lot of similarities from Western games, such as puzzle platformer and that kind of vibe. But the story that it tells tries to be original and to the culture that creates it. So I would say that if you do, if you have more content creators coming from the cultures which we are describing poorly, you'll have this new, uh, you know, better, more nuanced version of these worlds. We haven't yet decided for when our first planning meeting will be next year, but it'll probably be 